Welcome to Feed That Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We are co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly talk show for the rest of us, non-believers, secularists, and those committed to the separation between religion and government. We invite you to join the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists and agnostics, or you can simply ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, at FFRF.org. And we're absolutely delighted to welcome back Steven Pinker, who serves as FFRF's honorary president. He's an experimental psychologist who got his PhD from Harvard, now teaches there as the Johnstone Family Professor in the Department of Psychology and has also taught at Stanford and MIT. Stephen Pinker has won numerous awards for his research, his teaching, and his many books, too many to mention here, but they include The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, The Sense of Style, and of course, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. Steve Pinker has been named Humanist of the Year. He's received FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award, and he's been named one of Foreign Policy's World Top 100 Public Intellectuals and Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World Today. He is chair of the Usage Panel of the American Heritage Dictionary. And now Stephen Pinker has created a class on rationality and taught this gen ed class at Harvard this past spring. And that's the topic for today's show, how to think rationally. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters, Steve. Thank you. So I watched uh, a number of your lectures uh, before the virus and after. And uh, the last one that you presented in the whole series, you made a comment that finishing this course marks for you an important milestone in your teaching career. What is that? Well, it's the 40th year that I've been teaching as a professor. I can barely believe it, but that's what the calendar says. I did the math. You taught at Stanford, you taught at MIT, and now at Harvard, so 40 years. I, uh, that, that, that's what the numbers say. <laughs> so you have a new class. You've developed this new class on rationality. Uh, why did you decide to do that? A number of reasons. One of them is that of all of the things that we cognitive psychologists have discovered, the findings on uh, heuristics and biases and fallacies, all the ways in which our intuitive thinking goes wrong, is some of the most interesting and important. And uh, many people have been exposed to it from uh, the bestseller by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, and, and he, together with the late Amos Tversky, were pioneers in this research. Uh, and it is fun to teach. But the other side of that coin is, uh, if we now know all of the ways in which the human mind uh, can, it can go wrong, we're, we're subject to the gambler's fallacy, we think that if the roulette wheel comes up red five times in a row, it's due black. We think in stereotypes, we tend to confirm our prejudices rather than challenging with new evidence, a long list of, of uh, biases that we know people are vulnerable to. But then what ought we to be doing? And many social scientists are coming to believe that there are tools of rationality that every educated person should command. Just as we know how to add and we know how to spell and we know how to read, we should know uh, what Bayes' theorem is. We should know what's, what uh, statistical decision theory is, how to tell correlation from uh, causation. Uh, what are the basic concepts of game theory, like a, a public goods dilemma or a prisoner's dilemma? Um, that, uh, that the whole world looks different when you see them through the lens of these tools of rationality, which are also the benchmarks against which we say that, that humans are uh, can be irrational. What does it mean to be irrational? Well, there are cases in which we ought to be uh, using Bayesian reasoning, that which is to say, adjusting some prior credence in a hypothesis according to incoming evidence, uh, but people don't. That's, how, that's what entitles us to call them irrational. So we should learn what it takes to be ration, rational. So the final reason is, of course, that in the news, we are um, 
all scratch our heads at what seem to be bizarre failures of rationality in the, in, in the public sphere. People subscribe to conspiracy theories and quack cures and fake news and uh, tales of religious miracles. Uh, what's wrong with us? Uh, and, and why is it true that these um, outbursts of irrationality are increasing? If so, why and what can we do about them? So it's, it's a timely topic, even though, of course, the laws of logic and probability are timeless and they were discovered centuries ago, but it, it feels more acute now. So it's a, it's a deep class, but it's a fun class. You give a lot of examples and illusions and paradoxes and riddles and stuff that makes your brain just kind of go, wow, this is, this is fun. But this is a gen ed class, a, a basic class on rationality. So, so, so for just for the basics, how would you define the word rationality? Well, I, I define it as the ability to use knowledge to attain goals. It's and where knowledge is something like justified true belief. That is a belief that is motivated by some kind of uh, justification, whether it be logic or probability or empirical observation. Um, and you also have to use it for something. We don't really call someone rational just for thinking true thoughts. I mean, just from spinning out the digits of pi or or coming up with variations of a theorem. Uh, we, we call someone rational when they uh, they use their knowledge to uh, to get something. So critical thinking. Critical thinking is very much a part of it. The, the uh, avoiding fallacies like uh, the ad hominem arguments that is attacking the person rather than the idea. The argument from authority. Uh, so and so has got a Nobel Prize and he believes it, so it must be true. And we actually know, of course, that Nobel Prize winners can endorse some pretty kooky things in areas outside their expertise. Uh, the bandwagon effect, well, everyone checks their horoscope. How, how wrong could it be? So those uh, tools of critical thinking, that is avoiding informal fallacies, as philosophers call them, is very much a part of, uh, of the rationality curriculum. So you talk about the paradox of rationality. What does that mean? Well, we're, uh, you know, on the one hand, we're a pretty smart species. We've transformed the planet. Uh, we've figured out the secrets of life, of DNA, of, of uh, the, the Big Bang, the uh, plate tectonics. We've uh, eliminated smallpox. We uh, were, were victims of a pandemic, but we're going to uh, uh, control it very soon. Uh, on the other hand, people also believe that uh, Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring out of a pizzeria in, uh, in D.C. and that uh, jet airplanes are spewing out mind pacifying uh, chemicals high in the sky as some part of a secret government program, uh, to say nothing of the kind of you know, religious miracles and, and improbabilities that, uh, that, that your organization does so much to keep out of the public sphere. Um, so how can the same species be so smart and so wacky? And, <laughs> and that is a, was a challenge of the course, and that's a challenge of the book that I'm um, uh, adapting the course into. That's how you start the course. How can we be so smart and how can we be so stupid at the same time? Well, so, it's great to hear you're going to turn it into a book. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's uh, partly by, in response to popular demand, to my own surprise, the, the lectures which I put online got a, a, a large worldwide audience. And um, my, my uh, agent, my editor, people I spoke to thought this is it, it's a timely topic for a book. So this was the spring 2020 at Harvard Gen Ed class, and I found them online. How can people, they'll be up forever? People can watch these lectures then? But they're available now. Harvard has no problem with me putting them up, so, uh, so there they are. Now, Steve, I think that probably almost everybody supposes they're rational. So how can people really test and know, am I being rational? Indeed, I mean, and that's one of our irrationalities is we all think that we are, that, that it's the other guy who's irrational. Uh, it's one of many self-serving biases. Uh, we are uh, liable to motivated reasoning. That is, we deploy our rational faculties to move toward something that we want to be true in the first place rather than where the evidence takes us. So there's a whole family of, of um, irrationalities like that, including the delusion that only each one of us is rational and the other guy isn't. So part of it is we should, we've got to learn the tools of rationality. We really should, all of us, know about the law of large numbers and the trade-off between 
false alarms and misses in detecting a noisy signal and uh, correlation versus causation. But also, since it's just unavoidable that each one of us thinks that each one of us is rational and the other guy isn't, we need communities with rules of engagement that make us collectively smarter than any one of us can be individually. And if you look at what allows people to be rational, it's not that there exists some disinterested uh, genius who's free of all the biases that all of us, all the rest of us are liable to, is that we uh, submit to communities with rules that don't allow any one individual to impose his or her biases and fallacies on everyone else. So in science, we've got peer review. We don't say, well, Professor Big Shot has a Nobel Prize, so we're going to accept uh, what he says. Uh, he's got to submit his article just like anyone else, and then other people get to take their shots at it. In, in uh, politics, in government, we have checks and balances. We don't have a, uh, a monarch, an all-powerful leader. In the court system, we don't have an inquisitor who decides who's guilty or innocent, but we've got an adversarial system. In journalism, we have editors and fact-checkers. James Madison once said that the, in the, ess the essence of a democracy is that uh, uh, ambition must counter ambition. That is, you've got to take for granted that we're all flawed, we're all irrational, but let's hope that we can get our various uh, irrationalities to cancel out and that the rules of the game will allow the, the truth to settle. And it's not obvious what, always what those, those rules are going to be. So uh, what we've seen with the emergence of all of these uh, online sources of knowledge, some of them kind of get rationality kind of right. Like you know, Wikipedia, it's got a lot of flaws. But most of the most of the things you see on Wikipedia, you can have reasonable confidence that they're true. There's not you don't find anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, you don't find astrology and homeopathy. Whereas you know, Twitter, not so much. So something about the the rules of, of the uh, what appears, what doesn't, what gets corrected, uh, and what doesn't makes an entire kind of intellectual ecosystem rational or irrational even though it's too much to ask that any individual be rational or irrational, or be t totally rational. We're, none of us is capable of that by ourselves. So you point out that each one of us thinks on many different things that we're better than the, av better than the average driver, better than the average this or that. We, we have to take a break, but when we come back from the break, I'd like you to talk about this running survey you've been doing among your own students, showing that it, it's impossible. So we're talking with Professor Steven Pinker and the author about his class on rationality, which will soon be a book. And we'll be right back after the break with more Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name's Katie, and I'm an out-of-the-closet freethinker. I decided to shed religion because of its self-destructive tendencies. I witnessed firsthand the toll religion can take on your psyche as a Christian woman. I grew up judging people, proselytizing, and ridiculing them because their beliefs didn't coincide with mine. And let me tell you, if someone were to question my faith, I would not have any of it. It wasn't until I was working at a Christian camp that I met an atheist, and he taught me to think critically and view the world through a different lens. It was at this moment that I decided that I may never have been a believer. A sense of fear and community were really the only things holding me to my faith. As a proud woman and humanitarian, I would like to be the best version of myself, not the worst. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with the professor and author, Stephen Pinker, 
about his class, which is going to become a book on rationality. And before the break, you were talking about some fallacies that we have, including the fallacy that each of us or most of us thinks that we are better than average. And you've been conducting an ongoing experiment in your own classes about this. Is that right? Yeah, sometimes called the Lake Wobegon fallacy after Garrison Keillor's fictitious town in which the uh, women are strong, the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Hmm. The, uh, the fallacy being that not everyone can be above average, but we all tend to think that we're above average, at least in desirable traits like uh, honesty and intelligence and politeness. So uh, just for fun, every year, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, I give my class uh, a survey where they are asked to compare themselves against the other members of the class. Are you above average or below average in uh, neatness and politeness and honesty and in intelligence and in looks? And some of them, uh, your typical Harvard student doesn't care, like whether they're neater or not. But when it comes to niceness and honesty and intelligence, yes, more than half of the class consider themselves above class average. And don't let anyone tell you that findings in psychology are not replicable, replicable, the numbers come out almost the same year after year after year. So uh, talking about fallacies, what are some of the fallacies inside of religion or outside of religion? What are some of those fallacies that we're blind to in our daily lives? Well, the, uh, the um, argument from authority uh, is the source of, of uh, many religious uh, false beliefs, namely my, my uh, priest said it, the scriptures say it, uh, so I believe it. We just know that there aren't any authorities who are pipelines to the truth. And the bandwagon uh, uh, fallacy, namely if a billion people believe something, there's got to be something to it. Well, not necessarily. Uh, but also the, there are powerful intuitions that religion taps uh, that we, thanks to our best science, we can doubt. It's understandable that our ancestors believed them. Uh, they didn't know any better. So one of them is the, the argument for design, for example, the fact that living things are made out of organs like the eyeball and the heart that just seem exquisitely designed to carry something out. And it's natural to assume, well, if they show signs of design, there must have been a designer, namely God. Well, thanks to Charles Darwin, we do have an alternative to the theory of a, of a cosmic engineer, namely natural selection. We can see it in computer simulations. You can start from almost nothing and get basically an eyeball from generations of selection and, uh, and mutation. Uh, and so it's a, uh, a fallacy to let our uh, eye for complex design lead to the conclusion that there must be a designer. Another one that as a psychologist I, I find striking is um, what, what gives rise to people's um, be, uh, organized behavior? We see people uh, walking around and, and pursuing goals and talking to us, and uh, but then um, things happen that lead to the conclusion that there must be some non-physical soul or spirit that animates them. For example, we all um, dream. Uh, something happens and our, our body is in bed the whole time, but some part of us is up and about in the world. Uh, or we have an out-of-body experience from uh, a drug or a uh, fever. Uh, it seems like there's something, a soul, that can part company from the body. Uh, we see reflections in uh, glass or still water. We see shadows, which seem to capture some essence of ourselves that is not the same as the, the flesh we're made of. And most dramatically, when someone dies, uh, the, the body might look exactly the same as when they were alive a, a few minutes before, but some animating force seems to have left. It's very natural to, to posit the existence of a soul, which can leave the body when we dream or in a trance, leave the body permanently when we die. Today, thanks to our best science, we know that it's brain activity. Brain activity uh, leads uh, to uh, experience. It, is, it can be decoupled from our arms and legs when we're asleep. When the physiological activity that supports the uh, neural patterns stops, when, when, the, when the body dies, then our, uh, our, our mind goes out of existence. We can no longer move our arms and legs. So we, our best science gives us an alternative explanation for the obvious fact that we're not just our, our flesh, 
Uh, but if you don't appreciate that epiphany from science, it's natural to cling to the ancient idea of dualism, separate soul and body. Yeah. You also talk about in your class the confirmation bias. When I was a preacher, I would sometimes pray and my prayers were answered. It came true what I prayed for. So doesn't that prove that prayer works? And that is a, that's a classic psychology demonstration that people tend to look for the instances that confirm a proposition uh, and to uh, blow off the ones that are capable of disconfirming it. The classic example is if I give you some cards, and I say if there's a D on one side, uh, there's a three on the other, which cards do you have to turn over to see if the rule is true or false? They turn over the D. Sometimes they turn over the three. They forget to turn over the seven, huh. even though it's actually the seven that can disconfirm the rule, because if there's a D on one side and a seven on the other, then the rule would be toast. But that's the one that everyone forgets to check. So it's part of a general um, bias that we have not to look for the crucial cases that could falsify our belief. And of course, uh, you have a dream, something happened to your aunt, and sure enough, she, uh, she broke her toe. Um, you don't think about all the times that you dreamed that something happened to someone uh, and they didn't come true. Or all the prayers that I prayed that never happened. You only count, you only count the hits, right? And you, exactly. yeah, you ignore all those others. So. It's kind of like God gets the credit and never the blame. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's right. So that that's, uh, leads me to this question that you do talk about in your lectures about why do people believe in myths? Why do they like to believe in myths? Yeah, and it's, I think that strikes very close to the heart of the irrationalities that we read about and that we are uh, increasingly concerned about. How can people believe such kooky things? Uh, you know, they, they can get dressed, they, they hold a job, they pay their taxes, they, they buy their groceries. So they're clearly in touch with reality. But then they believe these kooky things, whether they're religious or conspiracy theories. And I tend to think that there are actually two kinds of belief. There's the reality mindset in which we have a pretty good understanding of the things that impinge on our lives. Then there's the mythology mindset for things that where it just doesn't really matter, like what happened 5,000 years ago or 13 billion years ago today. Uh, I mean, uh, how's that going to affect me now? A lot of people have the attitude, well, I can believe anything I want, or more accurately, I can believe something that A, makes a good story, B, has the right moral message, it has the right heroes and villains or something that happens in the halls of power to which I have no access, in Congress, in uh, the White House. Um, you know, it really doesn't matter what I believe. I'm not, yeah, I can vote, but I'm just one out of uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people. My vote isn't going to turn things around. So my beliefs don't really matter that much. Uh, so I can believe a really good story. Is it true? Is it not true? It's kind of beside the point. It's a great story. It has the right, it, it, the right heroes. It has the right uh, villains. Now, we, what we ought to believe, and I think since the Enlightenment, there has been an idea that all of your beliefs should be grounded in reality. Your belief about the origin of life and the universe, your belief about the history of the country, your belief about what happens in um, the corridors of power, uh, all of them should be as factually accurate as any mortal can, uh, can, can have them. But that is that universal realism is not universally held. For a lot of people, if it doesn't affect my life, um, any comforting myth is as good as our best vetted reality. And you say that this universal realism, which I think you're advocating, is pretty new historically, and it's kind of, what's the phrase, non-intuitive or psychologically, yeah. um, you know, we're not used to thinking like that. So how do we get into that mode of thinking like that? Yeah, it's a matter of education that uh, uh, we've got to instill the idea that you really can ask questions about what happened uh, a billion years ago using the, the tools of science. No one is ever certain of them, but we can rationally uh, improve our knowledge. Or the historical data, that there really is a fact of the matter as to whether slavery happened or the Holocaust. Uh, you can't just believe anything you want, uh, and nor are you simply accepting one person's narrative, there's a reason that some beliefs are standard, namely the historical evidence supports them, uh, and, and so on for all the other beliefs that we find interesting. No, you really can't just believe anything you want. There are ways of 
uh, of finding out, and, and there's a moral value in uh, believing that which has the greatest claim to being true. Hear, hear. <laughs> so we have a minute left here. Um, you had to change your course to virtual in the middle of the spring, uh, and you inserted a new class in there about COVID, because you, I don't think that was in your original series, and you in, inserted a class about COVID and, and the science behind that and the, the science deniers and all of that. So uh, can you tell us again how people can see that, even though your publisher might be discouraging it? We would, <laughs> That'll be fine. We would love yeah, to see. It's up there. It's uh, Rationality in a Time of Coronavirus is one of the lectures. I talk about the exponential growth bias, that people have a very hard time uh, wrapping their minds around exponential yeah. growth, which is the way a pandemic takes off. I talk about our emotion of disgust, which probably evolved to protect us against infectious disease, when we can actually uh, physically see something, like a bodily secretion or a vermin, or when, when we touch someone. Uh, it doesn't protect us so much when the transmission is invisible and distant. Yeah. Well, it's a great service to humanity to offer your class on rationality and to be writing a book about it. And thank you so much, Stephen Pinker, for joining us today. Joe, oh, thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure. It is a pleasure. And we want to thank you viewers for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.